Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Attempting to speak truly, if not truthfully, about lost things in lost places with lost words in a lost song, and somehow bring them to be found. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen. Here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, I thank those of you that have taken time to join me this evening. It seems that there's been great interest stirred in this whole uh, Thracian Chronicles as far as uh, what I've been covering. This will be second in the series on what I began last week in the Chronicles of Longinus, the being the soul, uh, the story of the Thracian soldier that was part of Legion, um, led armies into the Roman wars of conquest as they expound, expanded empire outwards into all directions. Um, and it's uh, an intriguing story because it seems to confirm much of what has been up until this time just mythology and i'll um and i apologize um the, i i was a little bit late and so i'm still in the process of opening a, up a couple things to to get the the show ready um and so for those that you know welcomed me and told me uh hello in the chat room i wasn't trying to ignore anybody but i was in the process of opening up a number of things and so I appreciate all of you, and I consider it a great honor to have this platform as truth to share dialogue with you and fellowship with you in all the ways that we're able to do um, in talking about, you know, some of these really interesting stories, as well as the current events of day and age and what's all going on in world. And so, um, so tonight will be a follow-up on that. And so just give me one minute here to open up a couple things. And also, because I only have um, three chapters that I'm going to be sharing this evening, and, and I don't, I'm not going to release the entirety of the text. It is 20 plus chapters. Um, I only have 11 that have been translated. But I did want to give you, you know, just kind of let you know what I was involved in, the current projects that I was working on, um, the book that I'm currently working on. As I stated in the last show, this will be a portion of the three books that we're going to be releasing. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for letting people know. Um, it will include the the three texts are the Book of Atom and Ua, and the Chronicles of Longinus and the Chronicles of Navi. And I told you a little bit about each in the last show that we did. Um, and I'll give you a brief rundown, and then you know I'll have plenty of time to cover when I want to this evening. But um, the Book of Adam and Eve from the Thracian Chronicles, in my opinion, is the oldest rendition of that particular story, which is found 
in several cultures. There's each one of them is different in in as far as the fullness of what they are able to share of the life of Adam and Eve. But basically, the story is uh, speaks about Adam and Eve being cast out of paradise, and then it describes their exile, their banishment here to the earth, and then their transformation into flesh. And it also details the difficulties that they had in um, making that transition and in being able to survive the whole situation of, you know, of having to learn to, to walk, to feed themselves, to eat and to drink and also clothe themselves, protect themselves from these different animals. Um, and also to deal with the fallen angels, Satan and the rebel angels, because they had been cast out prior and they were already here and ruling upon the earth and subjugating all the animals and the creatures, the pre Adamic beings that were then here. Um, and anyways, very fascinating text. I did a eight part series, which you can find on my YouTube channel under Endeavor Freedom. Just search for the book of Atom, A-T-A-M and Ua, E-U-A. Um, and you'll be able to find that series. And as I said, it's truly fascinating. And I actually did cover that whole book in, in its fullness. And the reason being is because I felt like um, nobody was going to want to transcribe all of that information into a text to, to, you know, to release it. It's just entirely too much. Um, as I said, it's over 80 plus chapters. And anyways, we're currently working on the Chronicle of Longinus, 20 plus chapters, um, intriguing story. Uh, I did the first part, and I did release it on YouTube, so you can find it there. If you go on my Facebook page, you'll find the link to this show, and in the commentary, a link to the show that I did previous last week. And um, a lot of people were greatly touched by it. There's a lot of commentary already on it, and it's been uh, it's been pretty widely viewed already. I mean. Not as much as a lot of my other videos, but it's certainly only been out for a short time. And so anyway, so the Chronicles of Navi has to do with the story of Orpheus, who was the, the high priest during the time of Sistox, who was the Thracian king that was sitting on the throne um, during the time when all of this information came to light. And this is uh, post flood after the the flood of Noah's day, and so this culture goes back um, to that particular time where you know 5500 BC uh, thereabouts. Um, very, uh, it's um, you know very deep into the past. Uh, uh, supposedly the stories are very ancient and are dated to that time. In their you know which the stories themselves are pre flood. But as far as Sistox and the Orpheus, this particular high priest, that you know they related a lot of this information and um, wrote it down and made it, you know, publicized it and made it widely available to the citizenry. Um, this is from that particular era and that particular reign. But as I said, the stories go back, you know, even to the time of Adam and Eve. And so I want to begin the show with just reading really quickly from the Wikipedia, which talks about Longinus. And you actually find that he was a saint. And this, um, just to give you a little bit of the mythology, talking about Longinus and what has already been known, because as I said, this text has not been available to public or the world. And so we have not had it as confirming witness. Of 
It was only recent with the um, with the decryption of the Thracian script by Dr. Stephen Guide, and, and this happened, you know, not but a, even a few years prior with the release of his four book set, the Thracian script decoded. And it's my opinion that there's, um, and nobody has said this outright, but uh, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Guide was poisoned um, and it led to his death. And it's my opinion that this um, would, was done in order to keep him from continuing his work and also from bringing forth the the information um, of the Thracian people and culture, because it verifies, as far as history and the timeline, that the Christianity as a faith and knowledge of Yeshua as Savior Messiah and being born into world predates the Sumerians um, and predates their entrance into, you know, as far as everybody, a lot of people believe and, and and assert that the biblical narrative is based upon the Sumerian pagan fallen angel mythological text, and that's just absolutely not true. Uh, Jerber asks, uh, Zen, are you going to relate scripture relating to the occupation of Oregon today? Um, I don't know of what you're talking about, Jerry Bear, so I'm not positive as to what Hijacker was talking about or yeah, no, that's that's not the plan for the evening. Um I'm gonna be covering, as I said, the Thracian Chronicles, and I'm actually gonna go ahead and get into the text. Um, and I'm going to read from the, the Wikipedia on Longinus. It says this. Longinus is a legendary figure of Christian history as the name given in medieval and some modern Christian traditions to the Roman soldier who pierced Jesus in his side with a lance, the holy lance, which in the occult it's uh, referred to as the spear of destiny. Um, when he was on the stake. This act created the last of the five holy wounds of Christ. The figure is unnamed in the Gospels. The Longinus legend further identifies this soldier as the centurion present at the crucifixion of Jesus who testified, quote, this man certainly was the son of God, end quote. Longinus's legend grew over the years to the point that he was said to have converted to Christianity after the crucifixion, and he is traditionally ven venerated as a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, and several other Christian communions. Origins of the legend. No name for this soldier is given in the Gospels. The name Longinus is found in the pseudepigraphal work, the Gospel of Nicodemus, that was appended to the apocryphal acts of Pilate. Longinus did not start out as a saint. An early tradition found in the 4th century pseudepigraphal letter of Herod to Pilate claims that Longinus suffered for having pierced Jesus and that he was condemned to a cave where every night a lion came and mauled him until dawn, after which his body healed back to normal in a pattern that would repeat till the end of time. Later, tradition turned him into a Christian convert, but as the Sabrine bearing Gould observed, whoever they are, the name of Longinus was not known to the Greeks previous to the patriarch Germanus in 715. It was introduced amongst the Westerns from the apocryphal Gospel of Nicodemus. There is no reliable authority for the acts and martyrdom of this saint. However, an old tradition does link the birthplace of Longinus with the small village of Lanciano, Samnite territory in today's Abruzzo region of central Italy. Just a little bit more uh, about this individual. The name is probably Latinized from the Greek 
lance, the word used for lance mentioned in John 19.34. It appears lettered on an illumination of the crucifixion beside the figure of the soldier holding a spear written perhaps contemporaneously in horizontal Greek letters, Loginus. In the Syria gospel manuscript illuminated by a certain rabbi in the year 586, in the Laurentinian library, Florence, the spear used is known as the Holy Lance, and more recently, especially in occult circles, as the Spear of Destiny, which was revered at Jerusalem by the 6th century, although neither the centurion nor the name Longinus were invoked in any surviving report. As the Lance of Longinus, the spear figures in the legends of the Holy Grail. All right. In some medieval folklore, such as the Golden Legend, the touch of Jesus' blood cures his blindness. Interesting in that. That was the story that Longinus relates to his son in the very beginning of this text uh, and was one of the primary reasons why he accepted Yeshua as the Son of God um, because he had heard about and learned about the works of Yeshua. You know, the, the Roman soldiers weren't very particularly keen in, in uh, following the work of, of Jesus prior to his death. Um, certainly, you know, the, he was well known as far as the Hebrew circles, but the Romans didn't really pay much attention. Um, but certainly he was known well enough that he had heard about his work and how he had healed so many. But um, I believe it, in the, the text it talks about um, how even in death, he was able to heal, you know, speaking about the blood healing Longinus. Christian legend has it that Longinus was a blind Roman centurion who thrust the spear into Christ's side at the crucifixion. Some of Jesus's blood fell upon his eyes and he was healed. Upon this miracle, Longinus believed in Jesus. Um, I'm not going to read the rest of it. It talks about his death. You can certainly read all that if you want to. And then it talks about different stories where Longinus is portrayed in you know, Hollywood movies and the things of that sort. And so, anyways, there are, I mean, when you look up, it, it, it was intriguing to me also in that um, when I was looking up some of the information and material on Longinus, I had discovered these writings by this particular uh, individual who was talking about how um, how they he and a group of his followers in the Philippines they he was talking about how they had had an encounter and were told by the Holy Spirit of Longinus and about how he had pierced the side of Christ and also that he had been healed. And what was interesting to me about the whole story is that, you know, there's not a lot of great information out there on this particular individual. And um, why anybody would make a, a story like that, you know, it just wouldn't make sense. But it, it if the Holy Spirit truly did um, give them this particular information and this knowledge, well, it was certainly spot on as far as the the relation of the story and um and the whole text you know as far as what i've been reading and sharing from now when we come back from the break i'm going to actually get into the text but i wanted to share one other story those of you that know and uh, follow even my other broadcast, you know that I have been talking about the you know how paradise um, is related to the mythology of Hyperborea. 
And in that show, in those shows, I talked about how even the Thracian Chronicles, the story of Thrace and the lore which is surrounding uh, the Thracian people is that they were from um, from the what I consider to be the cradle of humanity, which was near the North Polar regions, and how there was a a book that was recently released, well, in the 1800s, which also detailed this particular story and the information surrounding it, and that it might possibly be the site of Atlantis as well. Um, and that it was not, you know, as everybody else believes, possibly that cause so many others have, um, like the story of, I forget the, uh, Church Word, I believe is his name. He wrote several collections on the story of Atlantis. But I just wanted to share really quick this information, this particular article that I published on my website um, because it does really, um, you know, relate to Thrace, the Thracians as people, the story of Atlantis, um, paradise possibly being at the North Pole, that being the cradle of humanity, all of that, and the lore which is um, also cited uh, as Mer the the whole story of Mercator as it relates to the Arthurian legends um, of possible the Mount Sumeru, the magnetic mountain of uh, which all the compasses, um, you know, worldwide point towards, um, and also the the possible whirlpool and the description of the four rivers which split from paradise. Well, anyways. Just to give you a little bit of information on this story, we'll go into the Thracian Chronicles uh, once we come back from first break. Um, and, well, well, I'll just go into it before we run out of time. Because as I said, I don't have but three chapters to share with you this evening. All right, it says this. In his story, or actually four, um, in his story of Atlantis written on at around 360 BC, Plato mentioned a great island or continent across the Atlantic, one larger than Libya and Asia combined. This continent was so enormous, he said, it encompassed, wrapped around that veritable ocean. Is it possible that Plato was talking about the American continent at that and not that of Atlantis, as many automatically? assume when they read the story for the first time. Uh, let's not ignore that many scholars and researchers also show that proper translation of Plato's text places Atlantis in the Mediterranean and not in the Atlantic or some other exotic location. As I said, church words spoke about the land of Mu, which he says is um, you know, not exactly the that Atlantis and Mu were two different, um, basically two island archipelagos of the same culture and civilization and the same ancient peoples. I mean, all, and there's also reference that there might have been others, but the, those were the two largest and most well-known. But again, nobody really knows. Some say one was in Pacific, some say... One was in the Atlantic, you know, and possibly where B B Bimini and the Bahamas and that whole area is. And so there's still, you know, great speculation around it. Um, and the, the story of Atlantis, there's so many books written about it. But again, there's not a lot of facts and a lot of details on it. But as I was saying, it's my opinion that Hyperborea, uh, the stories of Hyperborea, and the peoples which are were living there, it relates to another a biblical story called the history of the Rechabites, which is interesting in that the Rechabites, because they were such a holy people, they were, according to the legend, 
they were taking uh, and allowed to enter into this land, which is sort of interdimensionally protected from all the other peoples and the reaches of people from around the world. And I, I'm actually planning on sharing that story when I do the next um, the next segment of Paradise, the Three Heavens, and the Throne of God. But, you know, as I said, nobody really knows the full legends, but it, it's my opinion that some of these stories seem to add up and allude to uh, this region as, as far as the polar north. All right, I'm going to continue, and then we'll pick up with the story of Longinus when we return. Roughly 20 years ago in 1996, Mark Mechanim, a professor of geology at Mount Holyoke College in the United States, discovered and interpreted a series of enig en enigmatic markings on the reverse side of a Carthaginian gold coin, minted circa 350 BC as an ancient map of the world. In the center of this world map, there is a clear depiction of the Mediterranean basin. An image to the right of it is inter interpreted to represent Asia, while the image to the left is interpreted to represent the American continent. Professor McNamon also found that all known specimens of this type of coin form the same type of world map. This was an interesting discovery, no doubt. However, what is most interesting about this find is that this particular Carthaginian coin was minted within the same decade when Plato unveiled the story of Atlantis and revealed that there was a large continent across from the pillars of Heracles. Uh, and it shows this particular map. If, if you, Well, we'll be right back. I apologize. The um, Somehow the mic went into mute again. But anyways, uh, I'm going to tell you really quick the story. I apologize, Cortec and everyone. Uh, for some reason, I released it and, and, and it went back into mute. But anyways, um, I'm just going to, for those that are not, have not heard about this particular text, did not hear the last show, let me catch you up on the story just a little bit, and then I'll go into it. Um, and I'm going to actually backtrack just a tiny bit because of, um, you know, because of, I only have four chapters to bring forth this evening. Yes. Um, let me type in the chat room. And then we'll continue. All right, so you'll be able to see. I know that you're just a little bit behind me, but um, anyways, so let me just continue so I don't run out of time. But so the story is that Longinus was talking about how he had, um, how he was, he had been invited to go out with the apostles. He, in working and, and you know, just hanging out with them, he met Lazarus. And in meeting Lazarus, Lazarus told him the story of basically how he was told and hoping that his sister and Yeshua were um, going to marry. And then she told him about that he was she was not attracted to him in that manner, but that she believed he was the son of God and that he was here for higher purpose and being here for higher purpose. He, um, she was not interested in him in that manner. And so Lazarus, and I'll make this quick. Lazarus basically told her to not tell anybody that she believed he was the son of God and that he was never witness to any of his miracles, but, um, Mary, having been witness to all of these miracles, and he, she, you know, absolutely believed him to be the Son of God and not just another one of the prophets who were able to, because of God, to do really incredible things, but that he had the authority uh, of being God incarnate. And so, anyways, um, 
I'm going to reread chapter 8 because it's the, I'm going to begin with the, the details of his dream. Because not wanting to believe that Yeshua was, um, you know, divine in that manner, Lazarus relates to Longinus that he has this dream. And, and it was shortly after that that he fell ill and actually died, which this story again aligns up with the scriptures and uh, will, and, and so it will help you to understand um, where I began this particular account. All right, and I apologize again for, I must have double clicked it or something. All right, continuing. Chapter eight. I wasn't just sick, but very sick. I, to, I had to lay in the bed and couldn't lift up my head. So bad it was. Um, also, in really quick commentary, um, you have to remember that the people that are translating this text, I have not fixed their translations, and English is not his predominant or his first language. So some of it may read a little bit weird, which is you know my whole purpose for being involved in the project is to fix um, those particular syntax and contextual errors and to make it more appealing to an English speaking, um, you know, as far as an English speaking reader. All right. Maria and Marta called for a doctor who gave me to drink some herb, but it didn't help. Then they called for Isis, which is the Thracian name for Jesus, for he for sure could cure me, but he and his disciples were far away. So I didn't live enough to see him. I couldn't bear it anymore to see myself and the sides, how I lay down on the bed and groan. I felt really bad, and when I was carrying away, uh, I saw myself how I left and entered again the room, and in the same time I saw myself from the sides how I lay on the bed having glassy eyes. I realized that I was dead because I saw my sisters hugging my body and crying inconsolably. The neighbors came also, but I was not waiting anymore. Now I felt easy and I flew away to some hill outside the city. He's basically talking about, you know, having one of these near-death experiences that um, are, you know, so relatable in, nowadays, but so many people have had these kind of things, especially with the advancements in medicine. But um, that's basically the description that Lazarus is giving. I saw the whole of my life before me like on a screen and many faces of relatives and acquaintances. I thought that I was already in the bosom of Abraham or in the Elysian fields as the Hellenes called them. But while I was in the hills, it suddenly darkened and it got scary. I saw a globe of light and when I came closer, I was confronted by some dark people who were very evil, whose appearance was disgusting. I tried to resist, but they were much stronger and I shouted for help. Unfortunately, Nobody came to rescue me. An another thing really quick. Isn't it interesting how those individuals that do have these near-death experiences, how they always relate um, being in seeing their whole fla life flash before their eyes as if they're watching a movie and everything is, um, you know, basically replayed for them? I, and the reason I say it's uh, so very interesting because this text, uh, as I mentioned, it goes back 5,500 B.C. You know, it, it goes back. It's very ancient, very old, thousands of years old, um, you know, uh, as far as, you know, some of the texts. Of course, Longinus being a contemporary to, um, to Yeshua goes back at least 2,000 years. So it's a... It's a very ancient text, and the way that it lines up with a lot of what 
eyewitness testimonies even today describe as um, intriguing to me. All right. They dragged me to a dark room, something which remained of a cave and unclothed me. Then they started to mock me. They put me on a rocky incline, syncline tube and began to fill it with boiling water. They felt satisfaction by watching me, how the water burned me and how I screamed in pain. They felt my body everywhere with their repulsive bony and long hands, crooked nails, and then they pricked me with heated spits and yelled with joy and satisfaction. Their faces were very evil but hidden behind masks. These were not humans. They were some odd deformed creatures from another world, probably demons and devils. There was a bad smell everywhere, stink and filth, and screams from the suffering that I couldn't see. The vaults of the caves were filled with smoke and steam, and they were glowing because of the fires. Everything was surrounded with horror and hopelessness, and after that they bound me with chains to some funeral stone where I heard whispers from the other dead, and I saw decomposed bodies and perishable remains on the ground of the cave. The darkness was indescribable and the horrors of hopelessness, hopelessness filled everything all around. I was in pain, but this time because of freezing cold. Besides that, I felt terrible thirst and hunger. I knew the same tormentors grabbed and inflicted on me again. The disgusting smell in the fiery room of the cave and torment with boiling water. They mocked me again, but this time in a more disgusting way, which I cannot describe because I am ashamed of it. After that, they bound me again with chains in the dark and the cold, where dwells terror and hopelessness. The dead bodies were decomposing and groaning with terror and fear by going to an eternal death. And now I was sure that this place was hell where the souls of the dead can never leave. There were no Elysian fields and no bosom of Abraham. There was only pain, endless pain, and there is nobody who can rescue you. I don't know why, but during, unexpected, during an unexpected moment, I recalled my dream in which I saw Isis as God in the chariot of God of Israel and the strong lions which rushed on with victorious roars. If he just could come here with that chariot, with those cherub beings, and tear apart my tormentors, oh, I would give everything if this could happen, only if he could take me out from this horrible place. And when I prayed secretly in my heart this to happen, then I heard a tremendous rumble in the womb of the earth, the vaults of the cave began to shake, and the big columns of stone were collapsing. I saw that the rocks of the vaults were supported by huge human-like colossuses of stone, which began to move, and they groaned with fear and pain, as if something was scaring and tormenting them. Groaning, the colossuses asked themselves, What is this? Who is disturbing our kingdom? Suddenly, I heard quite a powerful voice, as if it came from many tubes or horns, is what um, the translation should be, which uttered only one word, a word which was tearing down the walls of this underground kingdom. The name was Isis, and it went over and over. Then it strengthened, and the vibration of the echo ring, so tangible in all the underground vaults that it was awakening the hope in the depth of the human soul. The faces of the stone colossuses got crooked, and their backs twisted and distorted in agony for fear of pain. I want to make a really quick comment here. 
in the Gospel of Nicodemus, the when I was reading from the wiki about Longinus, it talked about how um, Longos was mentioned in a text called the Gospel of Nicodemus or the Acts of Pilate. And in this particular book, um, it gives a description, part two, of the Gospel of Nicodemus is called the Descent into Hell. And it's in this particular book, the Descent into Hell, that a description of Yeshua going down into the depths of Sheol and freeing the patriarchs, Adam, all the way to the thief on the cross. They are, you know, it's repeated in that particular story. And it gives the description of how Sheol, um, you know, and all the, the devils of Sheol and Tartarus, how they were all quaking with fear. Because, you know, nobody, of course, nobody had ever done this before. And nobody was able to just bust open their gates of brass and iron and their, um, their strong bonds over the people of Sheol. All right, continuing. Their armpits dumped down, dumped down in pieces, and the stone columns were falling down one after one. The hell was shaking and demolishing, and I saw how a bright image made entrance, fiery and glorious, glowing like the sun at its peak, a huge colossus of light and power, an image of goodness, warmth, and salvation. The shadows took to flight, shouting, God the Son, God the Son is coming. The chains dropped down instantly. I saw his eyes and I heard the world's most precious voice, which sounded like angelic music. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And after he reached his hand towards me, he caught me with his steady right hand. And in the blink of an eye, he pulled me out of the world to the world of light, pulled me out of Sheol to the world of light. I took a deep breath. I was alive. I was again in the world of the living. Chapter 9. They were hugging and kissing me, and I was hugging and kissing them back. Marta, Maria, Isis, Peter, Johan, and all the disciples. They couldn't get enough of being joyful, and they bowed down before Isis like bowing to Adoniah, Lord God. They told me that told me that I was buried in the graves three days. They gave some gave me something to eat and to drink. After I consumed little, they put me to sleep. I slept whole days long. And when I woke up, I started my life all over again. Now I knew who Isis was, and I thanked him. Not like to a man, but like to God. I wanted to be always near him. I walked with him almost everywhere. I wanted to become his disciple and to learn from him everything. I loved him, but who wouldn't? Lazarus's words had pressure on my mind because I wanted to ask him for more details regarding his experience in that place of the dead and resurrection. I have heard a lot about this place, which the Greeks and the Romans call Hades, and which we, the Thracians, call the Lake of Fire, a destination for the doomed souls. But something inside me said not to interrupt him, and therefore I continued to swallow every word he said. I didn't want to stop what he wanted to share. And he was so eager over his blazing memories, it would even be difficult to interrupt him, no matter how I tried. And so he continued with his honored and inspired speech. Many joined our group after they had seen some great miracles which Isis done in their life 
just like happened to me. I will not forget when once the elders of a village brought to Isis a woman who committed adultery. I speak of Maria from Migdona, a very beautiful woman. A few men could resist her if she desired someone. I'm not surprised that she was with many men because the men were so tempted. And when I saw her, me, myself, I had to look down so I wouldn't be tempted by her bared body, which I could see through her torn clothes when they brought and dragged her on the ground. They struck her face with the palms, with their palms, kicked her, pointed at her with finger and cursed her in the name of God, saying that she deserved to die. Then they brought her to Isis and his disciples, tossing her at his feet. People shouted and insisted that Isis should judge her to death according to the law of Moses. She was confused and in tears and horrified because she was expecting to be stoned to death by the crowd. Isis turned his back, took some steps and sat down. His disciples also sat down around him. The crowd stared at Isis and waited for his verdict. Then Isis looked down on the softening, mellow ground and started to write down something on a little piece of clay. I was near him, and so I focused on what he was writing, but this was not in our language. I saw something which confused me because from the signs which Isis wrote came out a small spurt of smoke, which made a rush in different directions. And when the little fumes arose, they formed immaterial figures of men who took... We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. And um, I made sure this time to take off the 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 mute and not double click it. But anyways, um I wanted to just quickly remind everybody that Revolution Radio could use those of you that can afford to and that are willing to please do support us in our cause and our endeavor to bring forth all the incredible information that we do as far as the many various hosts that come to you live twenty four seven. Um well not all hours there are a few gaps but mostly seven days a week you know 24 hours a day on uh, both studios a and studio b and that we really do appreciate the fellowship and the dialogue that you share with all of us um in helping us to you know to gain and reach an audience and to um to share in the ways that we can all of the information that we feel is important and that you should know about and that, um, you know, that is not uh, shared and not covered in various forums. And so those of you that can, please do go to freedomslips.com, click on the donate button and share what you may. All right. Um, I've got a couple more things that I want to cover and then one story that I will share, but I want to make sure I get through the text first. And so, continuing with the story of Mary Magdalene. They formed immaterial figures of men who took a stand around Isis and the disciples. I nudged Peter and asked him if he was seeing the same thing as I was. He looked at me with wondering eyes and said that there was nothing to see. Then I understood that nobody saw the things which I noticed. For the first time, I realized that after I came back to life, I could see and hear things, some things that I was not able to before. This was very odd feeling, but without a doubt, some big and important change had happened to me. I looked again at the immaterial spirit men who stood before Isis. The oldest one whispered to him and said, Yes, she is enlisted in the covenant, and your temple is her fortress. 
Issa nodded and looked down. He wrote something additional. The others also nodded. They moved away and took a stand one by one behind everybody who was against the woman. With their immaterial hands, they grabbed the shoulders and the hands of the accusers and prevented them from moving. Then Isis kept an eye on the elders and said to them, He who is without sin may cast the first stone at this woman. The faces of the accusers bent, relaxed, and dispersed one by one because the immaterial men were leading them to their homes. And when the crowd disappeared, the Lord said to the woman, Is there anybody who accuses you, woman? She replied, I see nobody. And Isis said to her again, Neither do I accuse you either, because of the covenant, but do not sin any more. And after what has been what has been said, he showed her the little piece of the clay on which he wrote with his hands. And when she saw the clay, she started to cry and fell on her knees before his feet with raised hands, like kneeling before some angel or God. And she bowed and bowed and said to him something in a language which I did not know. This was Maria from Migdona, from the land of Thrace. And from this day, she followed the Lord everywhere he went. And she was telling everybody joyfully, The Son giving God has found me, and only he is my beloved. Some of her former acquaintances were saying that she was from Migdala, a place located two days away, and called her the turbulent one of Migdala because people thought that she had gone mad and they wanted to terminate their acquaintances with her. But she came from Migdona eight years ago, and it was Isis who threw out of her the seven devils of depravity. There's a whole lot of footnotes, but I'm not going to read those. Um, I've got two more chapters to get through. And I want to share a story of longingness at the very end, but I want to make sure I get through this first. In chapter 10, I, Longinus, also knew Maria from Magdona. She was my compatriot and the most beautiful woman. Therefore, she was most preferable among the fornicators of hundreds of Roman soldiers. She was kind of an influential lady of pleasure because everybody talked joyfully about their love experience with her. Me, myself, had experienced one unforgettable night with her. I couldn't believe that she would abandon her profitable profession, but yet I was not surprised that Isis had such great influence on her, a powerful man who even in his death could heal my eye. I was quiet and wondered and wondered and was amazed over the incredible long short story coming out from the beneficial mouth of Lazarus. And when we returned home, Isis looked in my eyes and said to, said to me, remember what you have seen, but do not tell anybody about it, not before the Son of God has been glorified. But I did not intend to tell anybody because I didn't want to be considered crazy or damaged by my stay in the grave. You know, in those times, there were many people who were possessed in Galilee, one day, Isis gave a task to all of his disciples to divide in groups, a group of two or three, and to go out to the villages in order to uncover the possessed and to cast out demons and devils and to tell later 
about the results when we returned home after three days. I was in the same group as Brother in Faith Peter and Brother in Faith Bartholomew when we walked towards the Galilean lake, the Sea of Galilee. We already saw on our way a man at the big rock cliffs who was completely naked. When he saw us, he started to run towards us, and when he came close, he began to scream maliciously. He spat on us and staggered intimidatingly his head and bent himself on the chest and beat himself on the chest with his fist. He was dirty and smelled badly from a long ways off. His hair was dense and sticky, falling down over his ugly and bearded face. His nails were long and crushed, and his teeth were bent and, and yellow, though he was very big and strong and with fearful looks. Brother Peter, self-controlling -con himself, stood upright before him, tall as he was, he raised his hands and said confidently with loud and a firm voice, In the name of Adonai and his Messiah, I command you, unclean and evil spirit, to leave this man. The man began laughing. He lisped something and spat on Peter. It was disgusting. And then the three of us raised our hands at him and repeated the commandment. With loud voice, so the evil spirit might leave this man. The man just got mad and attacked us with his fist. He shouted, we shouted, leave him, leave him. But the possessed man beat us on the head and kicked us wherever possible. We tried to hold him and wanted to put his hands behind his back. But he was very robust and much stronger than the three of us put together. We were ashamed because we had to run back to where we had come from while the man screamed behind us using abusive words and intimidating us with his fists. He started to run after us, but it was difficult for him to run barefoot on the rocky ground, and so he gave up. We returned home the same day in order to clean up and to recover from this defeat. The next day, Peter and Bartholomew left in the morning in order to continue to chase evil spirits and to heal other possessed people. We will just try to do it with others who are not that strong, and then we may be able to hold them and to defeat them. What happened yesterday, it's rare, and most people are not like that, said Peter. Are you coming with us? but I preferred to stay at home because my right shoulder was hurt and it, it was hurt very much from the beating by this possessed man. When they left, I did some thinking and I decided to go see Isis before the determined time and to ask him what is wrong with us and why we were not able to heal the possessed. Do you know... L Lazarus, that when I commanded you to come out from the grave, people who were around could only see that I resurrected you. But only you yourself know best what happened in reality. You saw that I had to come to the very hell. I had to come to the depths of hell and pull you out of there. It is the same with these possessed people who are enslaved and bound by these demonic beasts. They are out the lounge of their own hell and the outwardly here when we command them to leave. But they do not see how we entered the boundary to their hell, hellish territory, which torments them. And so we can lead them out of the darkness in which they are. Come, we will go again to that man, you and me together, and I will show you how it is done, because you have eyes which can see. After Isis said that, 
He led me to the other side of the Galilean lake. Chapter 11. We took the boat in order to come across the lake, and, and when we were approaching its end close to the possessed man, we found ourselves in big waves. Soon ravaged a terrible storm, and so the water poured into our boat, which we had to scrape it up with our hollows. Otherwise, we would have drowned. Then the teacher said to me, look how this fierce and terrible storm is inside that man. We reached our destination and Isas rose and stood up in the boat, whispering some words. And then he uttered clearly, stop, be quiet. And the wind suddenly stopped and the storm got silent and the sea calmed down. I looked and I saw that our boat reached the rocky beach where we stay. Where stayed the possessed man? Behind the cliffs were hiding many dark and bad men, armed with spears and swords, and in front and in front showed up their leader. When we got out of the boat, I noticed something which I couldn't believe. I realized that Isis was a lot taller than all those people. And I didn't understand how I could miss that, that Isis is so tall and strong. Out of our boat also emerged many armed men who obviously followed us. But previously, I believed that I and Isis were the only ones who were in the boat. My mind couldn't grasp all this, especially when I saw how many men got out of the boat. Apparently, something unusual or not normal was happening. The leader of the dark soldiers, the soldiers who were hidden behind the cliffs, approached Isis and spread out at Isis's feet and said, We are legion, and I am their leader. But your legions are thousands. I beg you, great king, and Son of God, do not destroy us. Isis kicked him in the face with the sole of his sandal and thundered with his voice in such way that so all were numbed, and the rocks echoed. Isis's face turned flash, flashy like thunderbolt, which tears up the sky. You are not worthy to call yourselves soldiers. You are pigs who entered pigs, Yes, all of you are pigs, and only two of you are pig herds. I guess the, the leaders of the pig herds, but uh, as I said, you know, English is not his first language. So, Therefore, go and notify your chiefs that I am handling all of you over to the depth of the sea till the day of your judgment. After Isis said this, I focused my eyes carefully, and then I saw that from behind the cliffs came out numerous herds of pigs, which were shoving around and grunted, but the armed legions which I saw before were no more there. All right, we're almost done. And the herds of pigs rushed on headlong into the waters and all drowned, but the pig herds fled in disorder far away and went to their chiefs to report the verdict of Isis. I don't know how long time, how long it took all of this in time, but somebody touched my shoulder, and when I turned back, I saw only Isis standing by me. But not far away, I spotted that possessed man of which we spoke previously. He sat down calmly on a rock, and he was normal and clothed. And when he saw us, he climbed down and came to Isis, kneeling before him. He thanked him, kissed his feet, and asked him if he could join us. But Isis restrained him and said to him that it would be better if he went home to his family and told everybody what good God had done for him. After the man bowed down, 
He went home to tell about the miracle that Isis had done for him. We returned home with the boat to the other side of the Galilean lake. I told Maria and Marta about everything that happened, but they couldn't believe me when I said that Isis turned legions into pigs. Me, my, myself, was not sure what exactly I saw, but I believe that I am telling things as I saw and felt them in the moment. All right, and we have arrived to the end of the text. As I said, um, I only have, let me check the chat room while I'm making this comment. Um, I only have these 11 chapters of this particular text. I will at some other point, you know, when I receive all of them, I'll do a part three, but um, I'm going to try to save some of the chapters. So maybe what I'll do is I'll share one more story from the fullness of the text, and then I will um, save the rest just until publication. And then I'll do the same thing when I get the book of Nabi as well which hopefully won't be too much longer um, because uh, it, there's a whole different translator working on that text. And I've been informed that he's halfway through. And so, um, as I said in the previous show, I believe that by the end of spring, we will be able to release this text. And... Um, let me actually share with you a commentary from some of the people that have been watching it. And, um, and then when we come back from, for the final segment, I'll share that story that I wanted to relate with you because it's quite interesting. It speaks about the, uh, about the story of Longinus, how he foiled the the Pharisees, their attempt to, you know, keep people from the truth as far as Yeshua and that he was resurrected from, you know, the dead. And also, um, also about how he was martyred. All right, hold on one second. All right, let me see if I can find that one. There's a lot of really good quotes on here, but there's one that was specific that was very touching. Um, there's a couple, actually, but I'm going to share this one with you. It says, this was from Fawn. She says, I absolutely love the Thracian Chronicles, and I cannot wait to have it available in my own hands. To read to my children. I love how Longinus describes Jesus and his character, almost as if being able to see him for yourself. I cried, thank you, Brother Zen, for all of the work that you do for God's kingdom and in helping to bring us to awareness. Um, there's one other I want to share with you, too. Because... You know, I basically said how I was touched by this particular material as well. Uh, if I can find it. If not, then, as I said, we'll pick up the the story in the during a later time, and I will share with um, with you in the last segment this story about Longinus and his martyrdom and then we'll end it with that and i hope that you know you have enjoyed these particular texts um i know that in you know as far as revolution radio i try not to read too many scriptures because i know that a lot of you are here for commentary and that um 
and and that as far as audience that you know the majority of the people that come to the station uh, are not christians or that are not interested in just the biblical narrative and so i try to limit the the particular you know as far as how much scripture i read in reference uh, on this particular show but this was such an interesting text uh, and because it was short i thought it would be a benefit to everyone to be able to to hear it and to have chance to learn about something which they otherwise had never had chance to hear about or know about and it's you know it makes it brings unique content uh to this particular platform and um you know it also it uh for those that listen to it in the archives they they realize we're not just covering the other side of it as far as new age all right we'll be right back for final segment all right welcome back everybody for a final segment i do want to uh Remind those of you that have access to chat, um, my liaison in chat, uh, Sister Kathy Dunson, she has posted the link, um, and you can find it in the link section, because uh, what I did not know and now understand is that whenever somebody posts a link in the chat room, it will archive it in the links section. I believe that you can find that on the right hand side, but um, maybe one of the uh, the intermediaries, uh, maybe Patrick or somebody, can tell us where that is and share that with you. But if not, um, she'll post it again also in the chat. Actually, if you would do that. Uh, Kathy, that would be greatly appreciative. All right, um, the f final segment, and I want to read about the martyrdom of Longinus and give you an idea of also how he foiled the... I guess also one thing that I can do is give you the link to the Gospel of Nicodemus. Um, Kathy, would you mind sharing that with listening audience as well? The link for the Gospel of Nicodemus. As I said, it's number two. The second part, which is the descent into hell. It's a worthy read for those that have never looked into it or read it prior. It's an absolutely fascinating story and gives you know the whole tale in great in great elaboration more so than anywhere else that you can find in any other pseudepigraphal text it gives you the story of the three days that yeshua had um was away from his body when he was crucified on the cross and succumbed to death he wasn't just you know, in limbo, he left his body, descend, descended into hell, saved the patriarchs from Adam to the thief on the cross, um, resurrected them as the first fruits of the resurrected dead, took them to Michael in the third heaven where paradise is. They were baptized in the Archurusian lake. And then they were allowed. Then he took them before the Father and offered them as the resurrected first fruits, fulfilling the feast of first fruits, which is part of the Leviticus 23 feast days. And then he gave them over to the city of New Jerusalem and allowed them to enter into the uh, the paradise of God. And then he came here to the earth on the 17th of Nisan and perform the public wave offering, which is done by the high priest, uh, again, fulfilling the day of first fruits, the feast of first fruits. 
And then 50 days later, he sent the Holy Spirit to, uh, to his apostles, filling them for their task of going abroad and speaking to the various cultures and peoples and bringing people to the faith, which, um, which this whole story of longness also aligns with. All right, let me go ahead and read it because it's an interesting tale. All right. I'm glad that you're enjoying it, Tracy. Thank you for saying so, sister. All right, here we go. It says this. He stood transfixed at the foot of the cross, watching and wondering, full of awe and amazement. And then all at once, something was born in him, a spark of faith, a brand new beginning, and his life was changed forever. The divine Matthew, the evangelist, describes the moment of his conversion to Christianity with enormous power. And so when the centurion and those with him were, that were, who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. Matthew 27, 54. The centurion's name was Longinus, and he was in command of the Roman soldiers who presided over the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ on Golgotha. According, which I guess I should mention this too, uh, Golgotha is the name of the place of crucifixion. Um, and what it means is Goliath of Gath. And those of you that don't know the prophecy, which is the oldest prophecy of the Bible, Genesis 3.15, where it talks of where you, uh, the Most High God is telling Satan that he's going to put enmity between the, his seed and that of the seed of the woman, and that when um, it, it, they, the seed of the serpent, nips his heel, that the seed of the woman would crush his skull. And that how this was fulfilled was uh, Golgotha means Goliath of Gath. And during the war, the Philistines with the Israelites, during the time of Saul, David, the shepherd boy, went out there and confronted this Philistine giant. And he defeated him. He knocked him out with a sling. And then he went and used his own um, his own sword to cut his head off. And in cutting his head off, he then took his head back to Jerusalem and paraded it around the to the Hebrew, Hebrew Israelite people and verified that he indeed had killed the Philistine champion. And, um, you know, he, the later David also went to war with Goliath's four brothers. But anyways, so this was actually the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. Christ, Yeshua being the son of God and also the seed of the woman, had fulfilled the, um, this prophecy when he was crucified because Goliath's skull was crushing, I mean, was nipping at his heel at the same time that he was crushing the skull of the seed of the serpent. All right, continuing. According to some church traditions, Longinus was also the centurion who pierced Christ's side with a spear in order to confirm his death, after which the wound discharged a rush of blood and water that healed an eye. It says an eye infection. How funny. Uh, but no, he was blind in that eye. That is funny. That healed an eye infection which had been troubling Longinus greatly. <laughs> so funny. Anyways. Soon after the events at Golgotha, St. Longinus would play a major role in helping to establish the veracity of Christ's 
resurrection. After the Jewish elders who had ordered the death of the Holy Redeemer bribed several soldiers to spread the false report that the Savior's disciples had stolen his body under the cover of darkness and made off with it, St. Longinus ruined their devious plan. However, refusing to be bribed, he also insisted on telling the world that the true story of how Christ's body had risen into the glory of the resurrection. After learning that the Roman soldiers wanted no part of their conspiracy or their money, the Jews decided to rely on their usual ploy. They would simply murder this truth-telling centurion in cold blood. But the soldier was a man of courage and integrity. And as soon as he heard about the ploy, the plot against him, he took off um, to Cappadocia, where he spent many hours in prayerful devotion and rigorous fasting. Responding to the former centurion's compelling piety, many pagans in the region were also converted to the gospel and underwent baptism as a result. St. Longinus lived and moved among them freely for a time, then eventually returned home to live on his father's estate. But the perditious Jews were not finished with him, and their lies soon provoked Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor of Judea, under the emperor Tiberius Caesar, to issue a draconian order to his troops, find this renegade centurion and behead him immediately. Once again, however, the resourceful Long St. Longinus anticipated a plan against his life. Hurrying out to the roadway, he greeted his adversaries as friends without letting them know who he was. He invited them back to his own residence. He fed them lavishly, and when they fell asleep, he prepared himself for execution by praying throughout the night and then clothing himself in spotlessly white burial garb. As dawn approached, he drew his loyal companions to his side and instructed them to bury him at the top of a nearby hill. The stage was now set. Moving swiftly, the martyr approached the awakening soldiers and revealed his true identity. I am Longinus, the man you seek. Amazed and mortified by their host's honesty, the Romans were knocked completely off balance. How could they behead a man of such noble character? But even as they protect, as they protested against the execution, the great-hearted soldier insisted that they should carry out their orders to end his life. In the end, St. Longinus and the two fellow soldiers who had stood with him at the foot of the cross were taken to Jerusalem and beheaded, and the centurion's destiny as a martyr for Jesus Christ was fulfilled. Sighing mournfully over the tragedy they had been required to act out, the execution squad carried Longinus's head to Pilate, who immediately sent it on to the scheming Jews. They threw it on a dung heap outside Jerusalem. St. Longinus was dead, but the legends that would follow, this valorous warrior had only just been born. The power of those legends can be seen in another story that has persisted down through the ages. According to the narrative, a blind woman who was visiting Jerusalem in order to pray at its holy shrines experienced a mysterious dream in which St. Longinus appeared and told her where to find his head, which she should bury. The blind woman obeyed instantly and found a guide to lead her to the dung heap. There she located the saint's head and reverently, reverently transported it back to his native land of Cappadocia for burial. The story of the Roman soldier who watched Christ die and was then martyred himself lives on as a treasured narrative in the long history of the Holy Land saints. The life of this revered Christian 
reminds us that God the Father does not hesitate to award his saving grace to anyone who sincerely asks for it, including even those who were engaged directly in ending the life of his own beloved son. The idea that such healing grace is freely available to all has become a central tenet of the Christian faith, thanks in part to the courageous loyalty of the valiant soldier who died for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I think, um, you know, this story also portrays that how incredible, how forgiving, how compassionate the Most High God is to even forgive those who had led to the death of his son. I mean, I, I truly find that, I mean, what better example of forgiveness and how, you know, in the Lord's prayer that we should forgive those who trespassed against us. I mean, you know, I, why, why else would, Yeshua include that in telling us how to pray to the Father, that we are to ask um, even for forgiveness of ourselves and others, all those you know that trespassed against us. How incredible is that? Uh, and the the story as being a confirming witness to not only that prayer, but to the amazing, really, the example of the Father and the Son in doing exactly that. Not only instructing us in in doing that and praying for our enemies and praying for those that have harmed us, but in, you know, showing and exampling um, through this story and others how they are of similar character and that they um, likewise don't just, you know, as we so often do humanity, do as I say, not as I do, but that um, certainly they do example as they say. And so I think this is, um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful story. And it's one that touched me. I'm sure that you could, you could tell in the reading that uh, I I was touched uh, a few times, and that I had to uh, I had to s slow down in reading and stop uh, uh, at one point. And you know, I, I get moved in various ways when I read the various scriptures and talk about. Um, stories that not a lot of people have heard and read about because they are so very touching, especially when, like in the story that I had mentioned, the Gospel of Nicodemus, which I'm not sure if Kathy actually found you the, the link, but if not, I'll post it as well and share it with you. This one includes, not all of them do, but this one actually includes um, the second part, the Acts of Pilate. And in the very end of the second portion, the descent into hell, after the story, um, after Nicodemus gives the story of uh, Yeshua descending down into hell and then taking the former patriarchs up into heaven and then after they were baptized, they were allowed to enter into the city of God. It talks about the story of how the Pharisees knew that he was the Son of God and that he had fulfilled the holy, uh, not only the prophecies, but the, um, the prophetic texts um, that the other Old Testament patriarchs had provided to them previous and that he, um, you know, and it talks about how they hid this information. Like Pontius Pilate came to them 
They shut the temple doors. They kicked everybody out of the temple. They took him into a private room, and then they broke out the holy books, and they read to him um, several things that, you, you know, were prophecies and things that were requirements to confirm that Yeshua was the Son of God. And he fulfilled these things. And there's another prophecy, which is one of the oldest. It's also, it's found in the um, the Thracian text of the book of Atom and Ua. And it has to be one of the oldest prophecies, even before um, that, uh, you know, the prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Even though that's an old prophecy, we know that, you know, that, and I'm sure it goes back even further than being given to Moses, but this too is a very old prophecy, and it was given to Adam and Eve when they were banished out of paradise. Um, and, and they were told that, and this is found in that particular book, which again confirms that Yeshua would incarnate into the flesh, that he would be born of the seed of the woman, being born of a virgin uh, through immaculate conception, uh, that he would be crucified, he would die on the cross, and that he would resurrect. All this is included in that text. But specific was a story of how 5,500 years after the banishment, after their being cast out of paradise, that he would indeed come into the flesh and that he would be born of a woman named Mary and that he would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, this particular, you know, being born in Bethlehem, that's part of the Old Testament prophecies. I believe it was, um, if I'm correct, Malachi that said this, Malachi or Hosea. Uh, one of the minor prophets, but any, anyways, um, and so all of that is included in that text as well, which is one of the reasons why I have put several of my other books on hold in order to focus on publication of this particular text. Um, because I think it will confirm, and it's important in that it confirms that, you know, the that the Bible is not based upon the pagan fallen angel mythology, mythological Sumerian text, because everybody believes that the Sumerians are the oldest culture and civilization. When they're not, uh, they're the old one of the oldest post flood, but the Thracians precede them. You know, they precede them by 1,500 to 2,000 years. And it wasn't until recently with Dr. Stephen Guide's work, the Thracian script decoded, that, um, that we learned as a world that the Thracians had a written language. And that having a written language um, that the then the Thracian chronicles were made available to us. Previous to that, nobody was able to understand them nor read them. And so the stories just sat in silence. Um, and it reminds me of another story before we get to break. In, I believe it's the book of Jubilees in chapter 15, Solomon was taught by the Holy Spirit. Also, um, Abraham, both of them, this occurred twice. Uh, the, the one in the book of Jubilees is in reference to Abraham, but they were taught how to read the ancient languages of their forefathers by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the, the Hebrew language goes back to the time of 